Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 25th, 2013, and my guest is Kathy O'Neill, a data scientist who blogs at mathbabe.org. Kathy, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Now, I ended up at your website, MathBabe, somehow. I don't remember how. And I ended up reading a long post you wrote about Nate Silver's book, The Signal and the Noise, and your views on models and data, particularly in the financial sector, how we should think about them. And those are topics that come up often on this program. And two things jumped out at me as I read your words. One is that we had very similar views about the problems on Wall Street. And the second was that we had very different ideas, radically different, actually, on what to do about those problems. You're involved with Occupy Wall Street. Maybe I should be too, uh, or maybe you shouldn't be, but there's something weird going on there. The first three quarters of your post uh, or so could have been written by me, though I don't know if I could have written it as well. And I just disagreed with the last part. So what I want to do in this conversation is to look at where we agree and why we disagree. And I want to start with your story, which begins of all places on Wall Street how did you end up there? Why did you leave? And how did you finally end up at the other end of town, you could say, at Occupy Wall Street? So start with how you got to Wall Street to start to begin. Okay, sure. Um, let's see. I was a mathematician um, ever since I was you know, 14 in math camp. I wanted to be doing mathematics because I thought of it as beautiful and clean. And I liked the fact that you couldn't really disagree with the answer. Once you knew it, you had to prove. And it was... Uh, about, about as clean as you could get. Um, but when I got to being a professor at Barnard College, um, I sort of realized that for various reasons it wasn't suiting me, my, my personality. Like I had, you know, the, the feedback loop was very slow. People sort of judged you not on your actual merits, but on the, you know, reputation you had or the fact that you're a woman or various things like that. That just enraged me. <laughs> And I just realized I should just be in, I should be in business. I should be somewhere, um, you know, that uses mathematics because that's what I'm good at. Um, I should be somewhere where like the metric of success is completely clear. And that's one of the reasons that working at a hedge fund attracted me. I didn't know much about, in fact, I, I was really quite naive about what hedge funds did. Um, but it was 2006, and I applied, and I was a professor of math with papers published, and I could solve all their puzzles. They love people like you. <laughs> they do. Yes, they did seem to. Um, they offered me a job, and I took it, and I started in June 2007. Um, and, you know, basically exactly right before the credit crisis started. I entered into to June, and by August, there were, like, major tremors at D.E. Shaw, the hedge fund I was working at. And, you know, I, I sort of witnessed the crumbling of the world around these people in, in this hedge fund, and um, it was amazing. It was an amazing, like, sort of front row seat. Um, and one thing I realized over the two years I was there um, was that there was nothing clean about it. The way mathematics was being used, the way sort of the PhDs um, were being trotted, not, I mean, they weren't being trotted out because there's actually no sort of public face of a hedge fund, but like the way we were sort of um, thinking about ourselves and valuing ourselves because of our mathematical background, our PhD in physics and mathematics, it, it didn't, it didn't seem, it wasn't like a rational, logical thing. It was kind of this, it was more of a cultural decision. Um, let me try to be more precise about that. Um, so, you know, when you first get into a hedge fund, you, you might suspect if you're really naive that <laughs> a hedge fund is supposed to like actually find the correct price for the market, you know, like that we actually provide a service. And the reason we make so much money is because we're providing the service. And of course we should make money if we're doing something good or we're helping. Um, another thing that you hear is like, we're helping, um, 
Gucci is almost the same thing. We're helping like put money where it should go. Um, Allocate capital to its highest yeah. use. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's the um, jargon. You know, in the two years, I, I spent four years in finance altogether, as I'll say, but in the two years of the hedge fund, I don't think I've ever heard, I ever heard someone say, let's allocate this capital better. You know, it was all about, let's anticipate what dumb people are going to do so that we can make money off of them. And it was this dichotomy, like dumb versus smart money. We're smart money. They're dumb money. We are so smart that we deserve their money. It was essentially kind of an entitlement. Um, and it was really unattractive to me. Um, it sort of, it, I spent a lot of time at lunch trying to understand the sort of mindset of like, how, how does that, how does being good at math, you know, give us the right to, to do this because it's, because it's legal, but it didn't seem right. And it was particularly jarring to go through this kind of, um, discussion when the, the world was collapsing, you know, when, when every kind of assumption that we were making about how smart we were, actually didn't seem that smart. You know, we were losing money. We were bleeding money. We had no idea why. Um, there was just this complete cataclysmic event that did not follow any of our models. Our internal models to ourselves were, we are very, very smart. We are very, very rich. We must be, you know, godlike because we're so smart. Um, and it's just the overall thing. I, it's sort of the emperor has no clothes kind of event for me. And I, I just didn't want to be part of it. So in 2009, I, I decided, you know, now that I'm sort of an expert on um, algorithmic futures, I was a quant in the futures group. Maybe I should, you know, talk to the CFTC or the SEC or the New York Fed and ask them if they want me to help, you know, fix this mess. And so I applied to all those regulators, none of them. I'm glad to see that your innocence survived the hedge fund experience. <laughs> well, they weren't interested in me. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a couple more years to figure out why, um, which is to say that they just didn't actually want to solve those problems. So I didn't, I still didn't know what, what exactly was going on with fixing the problems, but I knew that I wanted to be part of fixing the problems. And so the best jo job I could get, it, I thought I could be part of that was at a risk firm uh, called risk metrics. Uh, and I was put, of, put in charge almost immediately um, of fixing the credit default swap model for the, for VAR value at risk. And I worked for quite a while on that. And um, after uh, a year, I thought I'd done a pretty good job. You know, there were lots of caveats, but I thought it was well understood in the system, in the market, by the, you know, by the clients. Then I got put on a job where I, uh, I answered the phone to the clients. And that's when my eyes really opened. And I realized that the two big to fail banks that were the clients of our risk firm were using it as a rubber stamp. They weren't even looking at the numbers. Um, and the only people that were re seriously looking at the numbers, which were few and far between, were quantitative hedge funds that were actually sort of risking their own money or cared enough about the money that they were risking to actually care about the risk. Like that the people, the very people who really should be caring about their risk just simply didn't care. And I didn't, I realized that I could spend my, the rest of my life doing mathematically um, improved models. But if no one actually looks at the numbers at the end of the day, there's no point. And that sort of opened my eyes to a larger thing, which, you know, goes to my Nate Silver post, which is, that a lot of the PhD like jobs you can get out in there in finance, especially, are window dressing jobs. You're, you know, it's basically a job. It's a company where they open their door to the client and then they sort of point to a back room filled with PhDs working furiously. They say, "Oh, don't don't worry about our product. You can have faith. We have PhDs." Um, and it, it it goes two ways. Like on the one hand, the the product doesn't have to be and any good because because we already have the the badge of authenticity coming from the back back room. On the other hand, like the half the time, the clients are also not they don't care if the product's good. It's like oh well, all I really need is to be able to tell my clients that I'm using products that have PhD you know back rooms. So it's this crazy um, farce, and um, that's. That's sort of – that realization made me just leave finance altogether in early 2011. So before we go on, I, I wanted to ask you about 
just a little bit about the culture in those places and, and your reaction to it. Of course, it's easy to over-dramatize moral and emotional issues after the fact in hindsight. But but my suspicion is is that when you were at lunch and worrying about the things you said you were worrying about, were you kind of alone? Um, did you find any people who sympathized with your concerns? And what do you think their attitude is toward these issues about smart money and dumb money and just being window dressing? Do you think they feel that way or do they think you're crazy or they're, do you think they're self-deceiving? Well, there's a few issues. Like, first of all, I want to say that I never witnessed any actual illegal or criminal activity at, you know, D. Shaw. Um, what was unappealing to me about being there was the arrogance and the greed and the, you know, and the mental, the mindset that I discussed. Um, not everyone was as intense about, you know, about this idea of, um, you know, we're smart, so we get to, um, we get to take money from stupid people. It's a certain. But I'll tell you the the, 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 the thing I really want to mention though is that, you know, the people, the people that were most intense about this were people who honestly seemed to me, I mean, I pitied them. So I don't want you to think it was like an intense and negative, hostile conversation. It was more like me realizing that these people were actually afraid. They were like somehow afraid. I, I sort of think of them as survivalists at this point. They probably, you know, they probably have land in Utah somewhere. You know, they were, they were like actually worried and would say so that, that the whole system is going to break any second. And when it breaks, I'm going to have enough food and I'm going to have enough money for my entire family. Um, we're not going to have to worry. So it was kind of a bunker mentality. Um, and I honestly, I was definitely, I stuck out like a sore thumb for more reasons than one. I mean, number one, I was a woman. I was the only female quant there. Um, I was one of the few people that had children. And I also was one of the people that was hired later in life. So I already had, you know, developed my own kind of, I to had totally developed a personality, you know, and, and moreover, as a mother, sort of, I was used to being the person that created culture and the, the culture there is used to like absorbing young men into the culture. So men are sort of chameleons inside a culture. And I was just simply not having that. So I never felt at all like I fit in, but I just want to throw one last thing in there, which is that having spoken to a few people from DE Shaw, even the ones I disagreed with, none of them actually ever felt like they stuck, they fit in. I think that was one of the characteristics of working at a hedge fund, that the, the competition inside the workplace is so fierce that everyone kind of feels like an outsider all the time. Yeah, there is a certain um, macho swagger. At least that's the reputation such places have. I, I have a few friends who work there in, in that industry and – at various times in their life, they've had that swagger, um, and um, maybe they always do. I don't know, <clears throat> but it's certainly something I think that's harder when you're younger. And as you say, if you don't have children, there's there's something you're a different kind of person than someone who is older with children, male or female. Yeah, and I, I just say I also was Larry Summers' quant when I was there, um, and he, you know, he's a he's a like pretty fierce person. But I'm just, I'm, I guess one of the things about me is that I'm just not intimidated by people. So for me, it was like an opportunity to study, you know, like major league macho behavior up close. But um, it, it, he didn't even impress me among, among the people I worked with. He was kind of middle of the pack in terms of macho behavior. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about where people were constantly posturing and trying to be as clever as possible and trying to best each other in conversation. So l lest our listeners uh, accuse you of a holier-than-thou attitude and mm -hmm. or sour grapes, uh, do you want to say anything good about it? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I loved about it was um, the care of, of statistical modeling. I mean, it was, it's a craft, and they've, they really taught it to me. And I really enjoyed that. I mean, intellectually, it was very stimulating. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons that when I left finance altogether, I started my blog because I thought to myself, this is, it's almost like a guilt, you know, like you go to, into finance, you learn the, the craft of being a quant, it's like a guild, but why should it be closed? Like I, I, you know, so I, I sort of resolved to kind of open up some of the statistical methods and um, I've been doing that on my blog. And I've also been doing that as being a data scientist. You know, once I left finance in 2011, I needed to figure out what to do with myself and how to make money. So I, I got a job um, as a data scientist in tech. And I realized that a lot of the quant skills I had developed um, were very translatable into, you know, modeling, not with um, financial data, but time series or something, but rather with like cookies trying to predict whether people are going to click on an ad and whether they're going to purchase. So that stuff is, is almost the same underlying statistical methods. I'm sorry, I lost you. You said translated into what? T- to translate my quant skills into data science skills. Uh-huh. Now, one of the things you said that is a little bit horrifying, but not particularly surprising to me, and, and maybe it's my bias – or yours, so I'd like to hear you clarify it, is uh, you said when you were answering the phone at, at risk metrics that you'd get these calls from the clients, the too big to fail banks, and um, you had the feeling they didn't really care about the data and the models. They just wanted to hear the answer and move on. Now, it just – obviously, that could be because they're not sophisticated enough to understand it. That's what they're paying you for. And could you elaborate on that and 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 – why you think that was the case? Because usually, when you sell somebody something, uh, they want to make sure it's good. <laughs> they don't; they're paying for it after all. Um, so, what? Where did that? Where does that feeling come from? And what do you think was going on there? Well, that feeling came directly from the kind of questions that people that the people who were in charge of the risk reports from the two big to fail banks would ask when they called. They would ask questions like, "Could you make this font bigger? Could you change this from blue to red?" You know, they'd care about the look of the report rather than what the actual numbers were. And moreover, like, you know, there were models they used that we later found out were broken and were given, giving actually nonsensical numbers, but they didn't notice. Um, We found out because one of the quantitative hedge funds, you know, tried the model and said, oh, this model is even worse than it used to be. We're not using this. <laughs> and we were like, oh, my God, the other people are using that model. They've never noticed. I mean, you, you definitely get a lot of evidence when you're on the phones with the clients. You get a lot of evidence about what they're looking at the actual report. And as for why that's true, I mean, it's, it's completely clear. Like, the, the taxpayers bailed out the banks. They're massive no one person understands the actual portfolios involved. By the way, not all the portfolios were even on the system because they had, you know, just too much stuff going on with those banks. Um, and a given person in the risk office does not feel personally liable to understand what's going on. And that was clear. And why should they? Yeah, and, and that, to me, those incentives are clearly – the root of the problem, um, if you don't have the incentive to pay attention, you won't. Um, so th- that's kind of straightforward, although others might argue it was just simply a failure of command and governance. So we, we can get into that maybe a little bit. But let, let's move to your comments on uh, Nate Silver. And I don't want to pick on Nate Silver. He, um, I've asked him to be on the program and it hasn't worked out. Maybe it will down the road. So we're, we're not going to – uh, pick on his book per se, but he's not alone in arguing that the financial crisis was to a large extent the result of simply the challenges of modeling complex phenomena like Wall Street, various Wall Street products. And it's just a question of doing it better. We just have to put our nose to the grindstone and we need more data and the people who built those models were well-intentioned. And you think that's the wrong perspective. Why? I do. And well, so yeah, two things. First of all, it's a common misconception that bad models created a financial disaster. In fact, corrupt financial institutions 
um, force the models to be bad because the corrupt financial institutions had the power over the quant teams and over their work and basically would not allow for a model that did not give them what they wanted to see. Um, so it's a sort of almost a completely, um, you know, cause and effect being confused there. Um, so that's one thing. And I can give examples of that. The other thing is that, yes, I, I agree that there's no reason to pick on Nate Silver. It, it was, um, it's a common mistake that people make and Nate Silver made it because he is essentially an expert in sort of finite game like strategies and finite game by that. I mean something like baseball um, or chess or poker or even polling where you know exactly what you're trying to do and you know, if you've succeeded and you've succeeded, if you've won the game or if you have a statistical edge over other baseball teams, but the, the actual data um, is without, there's just no question about what the data is. Like we all know whether someone actually got to first base or not, you know, it's publicly available. On the one hand, the data is publicly available. On the other hand, the results are, are completely, um, completely clear. You know, you either won the game or lost the game. There's some complexity about defensive fielding statistics, pitching luck. There, there, there are issues, but they're very different. Well, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's clear whether you are successful. If you have a statistical edge over somebody, um, and by you know, and you pick better, um, you know, AAA players or something, over time, I'm not, you know, and there's no proof in statistics. There's only evidence, but over time, you gain evidence that you have a better system, and everybody knows it because those people actually cause you to win more games. So, and I'm, I'm just pointing out that the sort of um, the metric of success is kind of public. The metric of success is win or loss of games. And similarly, in chess, you win the game or you lose the game. In poker, same thing. In polling, you predict what's going to happen in the poll and the election. So it's it's kind of all all of these are kind of finite games where your your incentives as a modeler are to be as accurate as possible every single time. Whereas uh, in finance, and this is where he sort of that Nate Silver and other people generalize to a place where it's not a finite game, it's actually an incredibly complicated game inside a political system with lots of pressures. Um, in that system, your incentive as a modeler is not necessarily to be accurate. Your incentive can be to not get fired or to get a big bonus. Um, you know, and that isn't often, in fact, what your, your incentives are. So, for example, if you're talking about... Um, if you're talking about credit rating agency modelers, I mean, their incentives were clearly to, to come up with a rating that they were being paid to, to give. How surprising. I, I, one, of the, one of the strangest aspects of the financial crisis is the people who argue that it's the rating agency's fault because they rated junk highly. Um, that was what they were paid to do. Why would you expect them to do otherwise? And they were paid to do that because partially – because the government created a, monop a duopoly of rating agencies, basically, and then privileged through regulation certain types of assets that got certain types of ratings, which allowed you to be more leveraged, such as AAA. So there, was, there wasn't enough AAA to go around. So that's life because AAA means really safe. And by definition, there's not a lot of really safe stuff. So Wall Street found a way to invent really safe stuff, which is very clever. And – but they need somebody to, to stamp at that. And so they found them. It's not, you know, it's kind of straightforward. It really is. And you said it better than I. I just wanted to add one other thing, which is that they get paid by their clients, you know, rather than by some third party right. to ask for um, a true rating. Who would be so stupid as to think that it's an objective? No, no savvy investor would trust those ratings given that the incentives were to pay them for that the client paid for. <laughs> no, Agreed. Agreed. So really, I mean, we're agreeing. Um, <laughs> really what I'm calling for with this post and with many other posts on that, babe, is for people just to, to be more skeptical, to, just to be more skeptical of systems because, in my opinion, systems like, like the credit rating agency within the financial system, um, they are models. In some sense, they're just – they're not mathematical models. They're political models, but they are modeling, like, how can you make a financial system – with uh, with trust, so that you don't have to do your own due diligence. So that's what that model is, and it's a it's a bad model. It's really misleading. Um, but I would also like to people to be skeptical of 
the underlying math models. But understand that there, that it's all about the incentives within a system. Um, that the the underlying math models might be bad, but the, there's might be a l- slightly larger model um, within that system that's actually working very well for some people. So, for example, with you know, we already did the credit rating agency. The credit rating agency model relied on poor mathematical models, but the larger model was these bankers sell this crap with good ratings and they get paid and they send some of that money back to the credit rating agencies. So that was a successful model. If you enlarge your definition of model to allow for political models, it's a success for the bankers who still have that money that they got bonuses from. And it's a success from the credit rating agency at, at, as long as it lasted. And now they have, you know, you could say some people might say that they have lost because the, of their reputational risk that they took on and they, they look bad, but they still exist. You know, the system hasn't even, hasn't been changed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it'd actually be a good you know, sort of thought experiment to, to try to, um, to say what it would mean for a model like that to fail. The banks still exist. The, uh, the credit rating still, still exists and the so whole system is still intact. And that, you know, and that brings me to why I'm in Occupy. Like I'm in Occupy because, you know, it's bad enough for us to realize, um, in retrospect, how, how, how much we should not have trusted the system, which we did trust, how much more skeptical we should have been. But it's another thing altogether to allow it to continue to be so ridiculous and not to now um, demand for a, a, a better system. I, I just want to add a footnote to that, which is uh, even uh, executives whose banks got swallowed up, such as Jimmy Kane at Bear Stearns, you hear, well, you know, he lost – at the peak of the crisis, he was – before the at the peak of the market, he was worth about $1.5 billion with a B. And then after the crisis, after Bear Stearns was sold to J.P. Morgan Chase, he was stuck with a mere $500 million. So the claim is he lost a billion dollars. So obviously he paid a price. But he didn't plan on losing a billion and Jamie Dimon didn't. Other people who rolled the dice didn't. And the point is that in the run-up, he got to keep five hundred million. That's really not a bad day, um, and he says so. You know, he says not really anything awkward about his lifetime uh, achievement when you can pocket five hundred million dollars. So his price was it was a pretty good deal for them. Those who quote lost and those who gambled and won. Not only do they get to keep the billion plus, but they get to swagger and feel good like they went like they did. And feel smarter than those other people, and um, that was the game they were playing. And there were some winners and losers, but the losers aren't on the street. It's just it's, five hundred million is not is not on the street. It's uh, no. it's a pretty easy life, and it's it's continuing now. I mean, look at Jamie Dimon, who you know apologizes for the London Whale, and then says, "Oh, but we had record profits this quarter, so everything's okay." I mean, he didn't actually say that, so everything's okay part. I'm throwing that in because that was kind of an implied idea. And, and, you know, I just want to say to Jamie Dimon, no, actually the fact that you guys have no controls and that you are highly profitable is exactly consistent with this system not being fixed and with the taxpayer payer bailout continuing. Yeah, well, he's gambling with my money, so it's um, – and yours – Talk, and you he mentioned got trouble, which means he only got eleven million dollars instead of twenty-two million dollars this year. Thank you. Yeah, That's tough. a serious punishment. Uh, t- what it, explain what the London Whale is, and um, I, I want to comment on that. Go ahead. So there was an office in London called CIO, Chief Investment Office, part of J.P. Morgan Chase, that was supposed to literally just prevent. To they were supposed to hedge. Their portfolio, so to prevent losses in their, in in the bank, that was their only job. It's supposed to be the safest office in the bank, and instead of being safe, they actually lost billions of dollars. I don't even know what the current amount is. Something like nine billion dollars with a B, um, and it you know they basically cornered a part of the credit default swap market, and people realized it. So you know they, it, it, but it doesn't really even matter. Like what? And by the way, you know, it also doesn't really even matter 
um, whether that was intentional or not. Like some people claim that, you know, well, the Dodd-Frank bill might have made it a little bit harder to make proprietary trades, so they were hiding proprietary trades in the CIO office. That's possibly true. I would give that a 75% truth. It, but it still doesn't matter because it just shows you that there's no controls in that bank, that Jamie Dimon does not have control over his bank. Um, and, you know, we just, and that, you know, no too big to fail bank is small enough to be understood and to be controlled. But moreover, like the scary part of it is like, I, you know, I would love to stop thinking about JB Diamond because like sincerely he's a jerk and I would, I just, I'd love to stop being in charge of thinking about that guy and all of his jobs right, and how he, and why should you, you could argue he lost $9 billion of his money that that's his problem. Just like, uh, any business that makes a bad decision, that that's the whole beauty of the business world. You make good decisions, you make a lot of money, you make bad decisions, you lose money or you go out of business and that's their problem. Let them fix it. Yeah, right. And if, if we had a world where I could ignore people who take on jobs that they can't do or that no, in fact, no one could do, I would love that. But that's not where we are right now. Instead, where we are is that the United States is doing bending over backwards to foam the runway for the banks to resolve their problems um, and we are stuck, you know, stuck with the bill if they screw up, which they do consistently. And we also can't, by the way, you know, and this is the going to the HSBC debacle. We can't actually punish them when they do criminal activities. That's, that, that's our stance anyway. What's the HSBC debacle? So the HS, HSBC, um, is a bank. It's a, I think it's a, it's the largest European bank. Um, it has recently been, uh, has, a, has agreed that it has been um, uh, laundering drug money as well as terrorist money um, for the last 10 years. And we, the United States government, um, sort of slapped it on the wrist with a, with a large fine that, you know, the fine itself is not, is being paid by the shareholders and is not, um, not enough to actually, you know, compare to the amount of profits they made on the actual deals. And moreover, no one's going to jail. Um, so that's, that's an example of our, our government just sort of throwing up their hands and saying, you know, if we actually try to get you guys in trouble for doing this criminal activity, then we would be, um, you know, threatening the financial stability and we can't possibly do that. So, Again, I just the the point is that we we don't we don't deal with the actual problems when they occur, but we also ignore them after they've occurred. We don't fix the actual underlying problems. And the biggest underlying problem is how big these things are, how interconnected they are, and how when the next problem comes, we won't be able to handle it. Well, we've created through public policy an incentive for them to get big and to become entangled. Um in a different world, that would be a, a bug. It's a feature right now for them. And so any everything pushes – I'm not saying there's a sinister conspiracy. Every once in a while I wonder if there is, but uh, – I'm not saying there is. But the natural incentives the political process has put in place is encouraging both size and um, entanglement. Um, and um, I, I just want to say I, I say this every once in a while, but I, I think it's important to say it again. I'm a capitalist. I love profit and I love loss. And profit without loss is the most destructive thing you can possibly imagine. And so a political system that has banks that um, make money at our expense as taxpayers and don't bear the losses is pretend or crony capitalism and or faux capitalism. And those of us who love capitalism shouldn't be defending their right to make profit or defending them by saying – well, they're just playing by the rules. They help write the rules. They help make the rules. They influence the rule makers as much as they can. And we can debate whether they're immoral or not or evil or dark or unethical or all those things or even something minor like jerks. That's that's not the key issue. To me, the key issue is the system itself is not healthy in the way the capitalism should be. And don't defend it. Those of you out there – um they're, they're going to destroy it. And uh, so I think it's important to expose it for what it is and not pretend it's something else or it's almost capitalism. It's not. And so even though I'm not in favor of breaking up the banks, 
to me, breaking up the banks would be better than the current situation, which is fake capitalism where they make money at taxpayers' expense. And by that, I don't literally mean just the bailouts. It's the opportunity to borrow money at, at low interest rates, be highly leveraged, which are things that wouldn't exist in a, in a normal free market. So I, just, I think that's just a, incredibly important for those out there who are, quote, on my ideological side. Now, Kathy, you're not on my ideological side. So I want to move to the next issue, which is Occupy Wall Street. Those of us who are not sympathetic to the entire idea of it, although might be sympathetic to parts of it, as I've just said, I don't know much about it. We see them on TV. It looks like a camp out experience, but it's um, that's not exactly what it is. So talk about what it is uh, and why you think it's important to continue it. Um, okay, so I just want to throw in just referring to the last comment, which is that I I have I'm I'm okay with either breaking up the banks or forcing the banks to be um, utility banks. I I think I we agree almost completely on the the problem with the well, banks right but, now. But my preference would be to just stop bailing them out and and stop subsidizing them through artificially low interest rates through the Fed and stop having them serve on the Fed's boards and let's get to real capitalism. My tolerance for breaking them up or making them utilities, um, though that horrifies me, but not as much as the current system horrifies me. That's that's my only caveat. So what would you have – you would have them fail, but then when people weren't getting their payroll, what would – I mean there would be problems. Yes, there would be. There would be pain. There would be pain and suffering and uh, just like we have pain and suffering now, the question is who would pay for it and uh, how long it would last and whether it would repeat. So in my view, the current system is poised to be a continuing boom and bust of irresponsible decision making. And and I would add this part is equally depressing and hidden, equally hidden, which is that as we joked about earlier on that you weren't – you didn't feel like you were allocating capital to its highest use. Uh, We are explicitly have a system – we have a system that explicitly – allocates capital not to its highest use. We've just spent trillions of dollars building more houses and bigger houses over the last 10 years, 15 years. Bad idea to be incentivize people to do that. We, we helped create that incentive through a whole bunch of public policies. That makes us poorer. Capital is scarce and valuable and we treat it badly. So I believe that – I agree that the transition from this current world we're in to a better world is not going to be painless – Unless you can make a credible promise, which is going to be hard to do. And I'm not suggesting that politicians could do what, I'm suge- what I'd like them to do. But that would be my preference. Interesting. I'm you know, interested in that idea. I think the difference between you and me is that I, I worry about I, – I mean I worry more. Let's say it this way. You can, you can, dis- you can t- you disagree. I worry more about the average person who has nothing to do with the financial system, has nothing to do with that mess – and is not going to um, get paid. And by the way, like the system as it is now just sucks. Um, and going to Occupy, um, look, first of all, there's a, lot of, there's a lot that happened at Occupy, even in the encampments, that, um, that, people, didn't, that do, people didn't see. Because clearly, I mean, this, this should make sense, that the people who didn't have a lot of time, who had jobs, who had children, such as myself, we didn't have a lot of time to spend at Occupy. I didn't sleep there. Um, I went there and had discussions with other people. It was a place to, for people to meet who did not think that the current system was re- working. Um, and in that sense, it, it worked extremely well. Other things about the en- encampment were not successful, and there were a lot of people who were just there for free food. Um, but w- what it did very well was to create a central location for meeting like-minded people. And it, in that sense, it just created a, a network of, of people who wanted to think about this, wanted to discuss this. Um, you know, and I think it's a continuing, you know, we don't have the encampments anymore, but we have a continuing mindset. The mindset of Occupy is perfectly exemplified by Occupy Sandy relief. Occupy Sandy sprung up because there were enough people who still had that idea, like we can't wait around for a corrupt system to come help. We are going you know, to do what we need to do as human beings with moral purpose at this moment right now, and that's what happened. And that's, that's the beauty of Occupy. It's not, and even if its name gets changed, it's, it's going to continue in my generation and the generation younger than me like as 
this is something that has nothing to do with corporate America. This is not government controlled. This is because it's a good idea we're doing this. So for me, Occupy is kind of a wonderful thing. It's a little bit of a hippie thing, but it's that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. So why would I, as a, um, well, I just have to mention, by the way, I think we're equally concerned about average people. I think the current system over the last 10 years had a brutal effect on average people. It encouraged people to buy houses that they thought they were going to be able to pay back and they could, loans they couldn't pay back. Um, it's destroying savers, incentives to save. Um, it's making people poorer in all kinds of ways. And it ultimately ended up in a recession that pushed in unemployment over 10%. So I don't think we disagree. I think we might not be equally confident on the benefits or costs of various policies to get us to a better world. But, but let's go back to Occupy. So what is – what would keep – if I if I were you, – you, you go to regular meetings still, correct? Yes. I, I, we have weekly meetings for the alternative banking group. And what do you do there? Would I be happy there or would I be I uncomfortable? <laughs> I think – I think you'd be interested. I would be interested in, in having you. Um, we, we talk about um, latest outrages. We'll talk about HSBC. We'll come up with events, um, planning. Um, you know, we have various audiences for our group. We have, um, we've been putting a lot of public comment letters together um, for the Volcker Rule and for, you know, general um, Dodd-Frank issues. We've been um, writing letters. We've, um, so, you know, for public consumption um, to, you know, the senators asking them, you know, to get a good treasury secretary, somebody that doesn't represent the banks. We're trying to set standards of that I think you could get get on board with of, as you said, let's not have, let's not have um, the people who are in charge of the banks also be in charge of regulation, um, that kind of thing. So and think- we talked about uh, how we could how we can um, educate people. And to some extent, I really think the education portion is over. I feel like I, I really haven't met people recently that don't understand that the system and the financial system is corrupt. Um, they seem to be doing their job for us. I mean, our job for us, in the sense that you know we want to talk in two senses. The first is that. We want to explain that this, you know, the system hasn't gotten better, and we don't have to because you know HSBC news comes out, and then most recently we've heard that Deutsche Bank is getting in trouble for manipulating the energy market in California um, in 2010. You know, these are things that happened way after the London Whale, way after the credit crisis. So it's just they're ex- they're just example after example of things that are happening now, so that we can see that the system is is still messed up. The other thing is that it's no longer an Occupy issue. I read uh, articles on Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal on a daily basis um, that I did not read five years ago about the moral bankruptcy of the current system. So I feel like the education part is somewhat, um, you know, we could put a little check mark next to that. I think what we're trying to focus on in Occupy is what do we do? How do we, uh, what are the pressure points of policymakers? How do we get you know, average people to um, feel empowered to 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 demand change. Um, we've had um, Sheila Bear come talk to our group. We've had Neil Borofsky come talk to our group. Um, I'd love to get Elizabeth Warren come talk to her. She claims to be the godmother of Occupy, so I'd love to talk to her. Um, we want to hear from those guys in terms of you know their insiders um, to Washington. Like, how do you how do you actually get something done? And I, I know that's a huge question that every, everybody would like to know the answer to that. Um, so well, that's one issue, but the other issue is how do we get the 99% to not just be disgusted with the system, but demand a better system? Yeah. Well, you know, I interviewed Neil Borowski for econ talk and we talked about your naivete earlier and he, he, ex- he displayed his as well. Like he displays it in his book and he went to Washington and actually thought that the people who work there would be trying to make the world a better place. He found a lot of them mainly cared about what their office looked like. Um, and I think, you know, obviously there were interesting issues here of not tactics, but what can be realistic about fixing a system that where all the incentives are not so healthy. It's easy to say, well, we just need to change the incentives, but the people who are in charge of 
changing those incentives kind of like the current system. It serves them and it's not obvious how you um, solve that. One way you solve it, it seems to me, is outrage or disgust. And I'm, I'll half agree with you about the education idea. I do think we've made some progress on education. But I'd say one of the groups we made the least progress with is my profession. Uh, economists generally, there are exceptions, obviously, but a lot of economists think that the bailouts are a good idea, that we didn't have a choice, that we shouldn't endure any pain, that the Fed is necessary, that the Fed does crucial work in keeping the crisis from spinning out of control. And of course, economists, I think, are compromised in their ability to speak openly and honestly about these things because they have a, a financial incentive like everybody else, most of them, many of them. And so I, I'm, I think the average American – makes is going to make it their at the attitudes of the average Americans can make it harder for the next generation of politicians and secretaries of treasury to send goodies to Wall Street but a lot of the elites I think are very tolerant of what presidents Bush and Obama did and I think what they did was awful um and so it's interesting to see whether the combina combination of Occupy, Tea Party, and the people who aren't paying attention at all, which is most people, obviously, whether they'll support policies as we've had. You know, when, when Hank Paulson said the world was coming to an end if we didn't get the TARP money, and I think it scared a lot of everyday people who, of course, can't pay attention enough to know whether he's telling the truth. And to be honest, I have no idea whether he was right. Of course, they didn't pass it right away. The world didn't come to an end, but – we still passed a horrific bill with all kinds of bizarro stuff in the middle of it that had nothing to do with the financial crisis. Wow, that's a lot there. <laughs> I do want to say about economists is that my experience with economists is that they don't actually understand how the financial system works. So, of course, they it's easier – and as you said, they also have, an, have their own incentives to keep the status quo. It doesn't surprise me considering those two things at the same time, you know, you know, you, why even learn how the financial system works if you're if you're going to learn that it's impossibly complicated and you can't you can't expect it to just continue continue as is. Um so they they're left sort of with an enormous amount of authority, not much understanding, and so the best they can do is continue to make these sort of meta economic models that they have very little evidence for. And I don't, I don't want to like dismiss all economists all at once, but that's sort of like what you see a lot is the way I should say it. And what you see a lot at the same time is economists saying, oh, yeah, the banks are not as bad off as they were, and our economy is slowly getting healthy. And, you know, they're just – there's incredibly um, surface descriptions, the metrics of yeah. health. It's naive too. <laughs> it's very naive because you have – what you have is a – festering wound underneath the surface that is being fed by by the fed the rates and stuff um it's only it's only even moving it's only alive because of these drastic measures we're taking um we're keeping a sort of something that should be dead alive and you know and we're looking a, a few feet above ground and saying hey you know grass is growing really slowly and that's good news and you know i don't see much good news and I, I sort of see the, the sort of economist as a whole as just simply their job simply is, for the most part, to talk about how good the news is. No, I think we're the physicists in the back room for the political process, actually. <laughs> um, let's uh, close by talking about experts. Um, you criticized Nate Silver for – he he wrote the following. This is neither the time nor the place for mass movements. This is the time for expert opinion. Once the experts, and I'm not one of them, have reached some kind of consensus about what's the best course of action and they haven't yet, then figure out who's impeding that action for political or other disingenuous reasons and tackle them. Do whatever you can to remove them from the playing field, but we're not at that stage yet. So that viewpoint I think is a very common viewpoint. We just need to get the smart people in charge and we'll get this thing fixed. And you obviously disagree. Well, listen, I'm smart. You know, One of the reasons I disagree is because I'm smart and I don't know what to do. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I know a lot of, and I know a lot of smart people who also don't know what to do. And I, lot of, I know a lot of slightly less smart people who's claim to know what to do. Um, and you know, so really what it comes down to for me is, uh, I want, I want there to be a strong way 
of, of asserting, I don't know. I want there to be like a, like a really macho <laughs> approach because <laughs> I think macho is kind of a key element in all of this. You know, you don't get listened to if you're, if you're, unless you're screaming, right? You get listened to if you're screaming, the world's going to end or the world's going to be great. That's, the, that's what's called news. Or I have the answer. I have the answer. And if you're saying, I don't know the answer and we have to think about it and we have to make sure the incentives are right and we have to make sure that um, the average person is protected from starvation and it's going to be hard and the people who are in power now are going to have less power and they're going to have less money. That doesn't sound like a very, you, you just don't get play on that. But I do think that, um, you know, the I don't know somehow needs to, needs to have more cultural um, weight. And I think part of that is starting with, that's how I've, dis- I've chosen to start. I've chosen to start by saying, distrust the expert. Just to be a skeptic. I want to first promote skepticism because once people sort of look under the covers to these, these mathematical models or whatever other models, political models, they realize that people are inside those, those systems are simply acting in their own best interests almost all the time. And then people will start saying, wait a second, that's, that's not working. How, what should we do? And that's when they, they will come to, you know, in ideal world, they would come to this moment of, I don't know. And they'd admit that they don't know. And then we'd actually get somewhere with our conversations. Well, I don't know is sort of the watchword of this program. Um, as long-time listeners know, it, and it's, if you want to dress it up a little bit, you can uh, dress it up in Hayek's 1974 Nobel Prize address, The Pretense of Knowledge. I think there's a lot of pretense of knowledge. But when you, um, when you said that I, about admitting you don't know, I was reminded of The Second Coming by Yeats. We don't get to quote Yeats much on this program, so I'm going to read the first, um, the first verse. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And that last line of that verse, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity, that to me is a big problem we have with experts. Yeah, and we have um, we have a lot to, to do. We have a lot of skepticism to sow, and then we have a lot of um, coming to the realization that we have to rethink this and then we have a lot of work to do to actually fix it. And, um, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to watch. And I think personally, I think it's, it's not going to really start happening until we see another crisis. I think that's plausible. Um, the only interesting question for me, you know, if it's, if that crisis is 25, 30, 40 years away, I don't think it'll have much of an impact. If it's three months, three years away, I think it'll have a huge impact um, as well as this lingering economic mediocrity that we've got right now and the high unemployment rate I think is still is still part of the part of the problem and part of the I think signal that people are taking that that things are not healthy really, even though people might say they are. I've got my eyes on Spain. Why? Well, I just feel like there's kind of two universes, and it's not just Spain, but Spain is where I'm looking. There's like the the diplomatic economist leadership universe where they constantly have meetings, and then there's like the street, and it's just a it's a totally different place. Like like agreements that you make up in the in the diplomatic regions. Just what does that mean to a person who who's doesn't have a job, did everything right, went to college, can't find, you know, can't, you know, get married and have children and can't find a job. You know, what does that mean to that person? And you mentioned Spain because their unemployment rate is 26%, I think. Right, exactly. And the youth unemployment rate is even worse. And I just feel like that's going to blow. And that's going to have a lot of repercussions. I don't know when, though. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't know it's going to. I, I, I guess my, my feeling is that it's, it's, it's certainly keep, worth keep, keeping a look, keeping a watch on. Well, those diplomatic meetings, those politician meetings that you're talking about, of course, those are exercises in pretending that you know everything and, 
you have to put the brave front on it and smile and say, you know, how it's going to work out and everything's fine and you're reassuring constantly. Illusion of control, illusion of understanding. So, you know, for me, the lesson is we need a different political system, one where there's less power for those people and more power out here. Um, that's also where I think my views and yours probably dovetail, but we might have a different ideal of what that might represent. Yeah. You want to say anything about your ideal? What your what your financials what your what would be your ideal relationship between say government and the financial sector? Well, I certain I don't know exactly what it how it would look because I actually have I, I don't have a specific um, framework in mind. I have there's plenty of frameworks that what I would be happy with. I can let me characterize frameworks that I would be happy with. One where. Um, you know, there was, there's actual separation. So Sheila Bear actually came up with this idea as a demand for Occupy, which I think is a good one, um, where you, you know, if you work as a regulator, you just never, you never work as a banker. Like there's a strict line and you've, you've said, I'm, I'm a public servant. I'm working for regulation and I'm never going to go work for the bank because the, you know, revolving door is an enormous problem. This is, this is the bear rule. <laughs> <laughs> and the lobbyist, of course, is a different kind of revolving door problem where you have people working on the behalf of the banks and then they're also – they have lots of connections with politicians. So they could be ex-politicians, for example. Um, and you know, there I would, I would love to see much stricter rules on how much money banks put into lobbying. And actually, even better, I'd love to see banks – say, hey, nobody trusts us. They think we're bad guys. We're going to stop lobbying. We're not going to put any more money into lobbying. That would, that would go a long way to helping me to start like forming a trusting relationship with banks again. Yeah. Uh, I don't shame, see that shame would be a good thing. Um, and it's remarkably scarce in a modern America. Right. So bring back the shame. I mean, for me, Occupy is a moral issue. And that's why, as a, you know, that's why I'm kind of, I consider myself kind of a perfect person to talk about the emptiness of mathematical modelers, modeling. As a mathematical modeler, I can tell you, it has nothing to do with morals. You can model anything you want, and you can make it fancy, and you can make it, um, you know, Markovian, and you can put, <laughs> you know, uncertainty into the model and make it sound like you've done all sorts of things. But in the end, we're trying to make decisions about people's lives, and it's a moral decision. It's not a mathematical decision. Mathematical models are, most, for the most part, not useful, and it shouldn't be used. Well, I, I couldn't agree more in, in the sense that it is, it is possible that the best solution to all of this is better morality, more shame – less exploitation of the system. I know the incentives are otherwise, but we don't respond to every incentive we have. It's sometimes a bad idea to do that. It doesn't it may be natural, but it's not good. And um, it's by far the cheapest way to monitor bad behavior is morality. And if we don't get closer to... You can't depend on people to be moral. Say you again? Can't just... I, at this point, I, I'm no longer willing to assume that people will oh, act more. Oh, I couldn't agree more. But if I want to think about what might lead us to a better world, it would be a world where people felt guilty about exploiting such a system as we have. That would be much mm -hmm. better than trying to change it politically. And it's just a, diff a different approach we might – you people like you and I might think about as a way to um, make the world a better place. We're always thinking about the political solution – either more government or less government as a way to make it better. And um, some of what we need is uh, not better human beings, but human beings with maybe a little more a culture that we inhabit that maybe would have more shame and guilt at taking advantage of other people. And by the way, I mean, I don't want us to be too idealistic. What my, new, my new thing, you know, having left finance is I now work in the internet tech thing scene. The modeling there is potentially even worse than the financial modeling, the, the financial crisis. The amount, the, the potential for affecting people's lives negatively and, you know, the predatoriness of the modeling. 
and the secrecy of it make it, it's a kind of a really toxic combination in my, in my opinion. Like on the one hand, you might have enough public outcry from Occupy and Tea Party and other people about bailouts. You, I can't imagine a world where the bank CEOs of the too big to fail banks say, you know what, we're cutting ourselves down to size and we're not going to do lobbyist money. We're not going to do lobbying anymore. I can kind of imagine that. What I cannot imagine is the people who work on the dark side of the of information warehousing on the internet that are selling information about people to make a quick buck saying, oh, I shouldn't do this because it's not a good idea. That's not going to happen. I mean, and that's where we might really differ because I, I would be call, I am calling for strong privacy, data privacy laws that to disallow that kind of behavior. Right now there's basically no regulation on information on the web which means you know you can buy a, pers- a persona of a of a random person from a data where from a data information um seller um and you know that person has no no like legal justification to prevent you from doing that so you know my here's an example if i'm an insurance and i want to get you know i want to do the best job i can in pricing somebody's um benefits i'm going or policy I'm going to get a, um, you know, I'm going to see what they've been searching for. Have they been searching for HIV treatment? Have they been, you know, buying, buying a, you know, a wheelchairs? Like I can figure out a lot about somebody Order, by looking at their Ordering a lot of French fries from Peapod. <laughs> exactly. Or yeah, exactly. Buying cigarettes or something. Yeah. The point is that um, at this point, we're, there's just no pushback to exploiting people's, in you know, private behavior. Um, and that'd be one thing if it was just, I, who, who do I want to offer um, a deal for by like, going to Miami on the, on, on United Airlines, which most people think about when they think about this kind of segmentation uh, modeling on the web. But when it comes to things like insurance, you know, it, it, it sort of, it actually defeats the purpose of insurance, which is supposed to be pooled risk. If I, if I'm a, as an insurance provider, I can actually pinpoint exactly how risky you are and then charge you accordingly, then I'm going to be charging the very people who need insurance the most, and it won't be insurance anymore. Well, I think that that's a long and interesting topic, maybe for another time. I, th- I do think, though, that your point about skepticism, about the ability of people to self-monitor their misbehavior is probably correct, and it ties into the earlier point you made, which is if we had a little more transparency – about an education about what's going on for the prominent people, at least there would be some hope of shame uh, rather than the, those folks getting honored. So I think that's where uh, maybe there's some hope. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm not going to wait too long for Jamie Dimon, but I just don't think that guy has shame. <laughs> My guest today has been Kathy O'Neill. Kathy, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.